Hi, welcome to our election special here. And uh, they say all politics is local, and the Oklahoman has the best local politics reporters around, and we've got three of them with us today. Uh, Chris Castile, Carmen Foreman, and Kayla Branch are here to talk about the upcoming election on June 30th. Uh, and we have a lot of issues, a lot of people that are running. I'm going to start with you, Carmen, if you don't mind, and we can talk about the state question that everybody in the state of Oklahoma can vote on, all eligible voters. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, do you have a sense of which way that thing is going to go? Yeah, um, great question. This is some uh, state question 802, Medicaid expansion. Um, Oklahoma is one of 14 states that has not yet expanded Medicaid. Um, and so, you know, proponents say that expanding Medicaid will get um, more low-income Oklahomans um, the health coverage that they need. Um, and then, you know, you have folks on the other side that are saying they're concerned about how much a Medicaid expansion could cost Oklahoma, especially considering, you know, uh, Oklahoma is sometimes not so good at managing its money in general. Um, and so I think a lot of folks think that the state question will pass. Um, this is an issue that's been talked about forever in Oklahoma, it seems like. I mean, it's it's passed through the Mary Fallon administration, now under the state administration, and um, no doubt Oklahoma ranks toward the bottom in a lot of health rankings. Um, and so I've, I've heard Republicans and Democrats alike both say that they are cautiously optimistic that they think the question will pass. Okay. I know there's a lot of interest in it, and certainly there's been a lot of advertising. I took some out of my mailbox today. Um, now, I know you're also covering, there's a ton of legislative races, uh, and you're on top of a lot of those. What are some of the ones that you're keeping a close eye on? Yeah, um, so here in Oklahoma City, there are two um, primary races in particular that are getting a lot of attention. And so the first one is Representative Jason Dunnington. There is a woman named Marie Turner who is running against him. Um, and Marie is definitely what you would consider to be a one of those AOC types, one of those super progressives out there nowadays. And she's getting a lot of attention, I think, in part because of her experience with the ACLU and then also um, the fact that she's just very diverse as a candidate. Um, she's black, she's queer. If, uh, if elected and if she won, um, I think there is a Republican challenger down the line. If she were to beat that person, she would be the first Muslim woman or was Muslim legislator period elected to Oklahoma State House. Um, but then again, you know, Jason Dunnington has this sort of um, uh, democratic vibe where he kind of, he gets along with both sides of the aisle, he gets a lot done, um, and he would be the second most senior Democrat in the House if he were reelected. Um, then uh, we have Representative A.J. Pittman, who um, represents a large swath of the black community in Oklahoma City, and she has drawn a primary opponent from uh, the daughter of the first black man in the Oklahoma State Senate, and that would that was E. Melvin Porter, former state senator, um, and his daughter Susan Porter is uh, challenging A.J. Pittman for the Democratic nomination. Um, there are, you know, that's only a small fraction of the races. There are a lot more races to watch, and um, we'll just kind of be keeping our eyes on which incumbents might be beat. Um, and there's a lot of folks saying that. Uh, incumbents may have an even easier go of it this year because uh, challengers haven't had as much of an opportunity to get their name out there because of COVID-19. Well, I know it seems like every election cycle, there's always a race that surprises you. So we'll, you know, certainly be keeping an eye on everything to see if somebody goes down that we don't expect. Uh, let me go to Chris Castile now. Uh, Chris, I know a, certainly a lot of people here in the Metro have a great deal of interest in the fifth district congressional race, which a lot of people in the Metro will be able to vote in. Uh, tell us about the uh, large number of Republicans running for that seat. All right, Don. First, I should say that I'm so old, I covered E. Melvin Porter when uh, he was still in the state Senate. It was the last, last few years of his career, maybe actually been his last term, but um, fascinating guy, a uh, long history. Um, fifth district race, it's, Expected to be this fall, one of the most closely watched congressional races in the country. It was a, a district won by Democrat Kendra Horn 
in 2018 in a district that had been carried by Donald Trump. And I think there's about 30 of those uh, in the country in 2018 that were like that when the Democrats took over the House. Republicans won them all back. It starts on Tuesday. Um, there are nine Republican candidates uh, vying uh, for the nomination. One's a state senator. Another one has uh, held state office. Uh, Janet Barisi, former state school superintendent, is a local businessman. David Hill and a longtime businesswoman here, Terry Neese. Those are the main contenders. And I, I feel like Stephanie Bice has a really good shot of making the runoff the, into the, going into the second round. She has a uh, political base in the right part of the district, a Republican part of the district uh, that she carried uh, very well uh, for her reelection in 2018. So it seems to me, you know, going into Tuesday that the race is for the second spot in the runoff. The runoff will be held August 25th. Um, Kendra Horner herself, the Democrat, has a kind of a token candidate, um, a guy who's uh, Tom Guild from Edmond, who's run, I think, every year since 2010 when Langford uh, won the seat. So um, that, that's that's how it's set up uh, right now, Don. There's a lot of advertising being done in the metro area by the Republicans. Um, earlier this week, uh, con the conservative Club for Growth uh, group came out attacking Stephanie Bice with an ad that likened, it didn't liken her to Harvey Weinstein, but put her in the same frame of a, of a television commercial, which was, you know, shocking probably to many and uh, quite offensive to Stephanie Bice. She has responded and, uh, um, they've responded back. So going into uh, Tuesday's election, you've got Stephanie Bice versus these other candidates and Club for Growth. Yeah, that was that was quite an ad. Uh, yeah, and it, all because State Senator Bice voted for a film tax credit. That's quite the leap. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, well, I will say this. Um, she came back with an ad responding to that ad talking about how they're never Trumpers and she stands with Trump. Well, um, <laughs> that presents its own difficulties, I would think, for a candidate uh, who's, you know, concerned about um, these kinds of sexual pro sexual uh, assault allegations that Harvey Weinstein is facing, given the fact that, you know, um, in 2016, a month before the election, that Access Hollywood tape leaked uh, with Donald Trump saying some um, pretty um, outrageous things about women and, and his approach to women. So in order to kind of defend herself against this ad, she's fallen back on her support for Trump, which um, I, I don't, she doesn't seem to be uncomfortable with. Well, do you figure, Chris, at the end of the day, with so many Republican candidates that you're, we're going to end up with a runoff? No doubt. I, I'd say no doubt. I mean, I, you know, even I, I think best case scenario for uh, bias is that she gets into mid 30s. And you have to in order to avoid a runoff, in order to avoid to win the nomination without a runoff, you get have to get 50 percent plus one. With nine candidates, that is just highly unlikely. So like I said, I think this is round one. Well, let's shift to another race that maybe isn't quite so up in the air. Uh, but Jim Inhofe is kind of an icon of uh, Oklahoma Republican politics. He's been around for a long time, uh, and he's got a race. Uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Senate seat. Yeah, um, he's the, one, uh, the only one of the, the two U.S. senators up, up this time. Uh, Jim Inhofe's running. He's been in the Senate since 1994. And there's, um, there's a handful of Democrats in the primary on Tuesday. The clear favorite is a former television reporter from Oklahoma City named Abby Broyles, who's raised a bit of money. Um, but, you know, she has to take on Inhofe in the fall with Trump on the ballot in a, in a red state. So she's got that would, that's a pretty big hill to climb. Yeah. Mountain. Mountain. It's like James Mountain Inhofe. Okay. Well, let me go to Kayla. Kayla covers a lot of county uh, uh, matters, and uh, and we've got some interesting county races too. Uh, I think starting with the sheriff's race, where you've got uh, contested races on both sides of the ballot. Talk about that a little bit. Right. Yeah. The the Oklahoma County Sheriff's race is probably the one to watch with Oklahoma County this year. And um, there are five candidates: two Democrats, three Republicans. All of them have former law enforcement experience. 
Um, the current sheriff, P.D. Taylor, he did file for re-election. Um, and, you know, folks have been paying attention to this race for quite a while, um, just because the Oakland County Jail, which has been managed by the county sheriff for, you know, decades, it, it has a lot of problems, uh, historical problems. So folks have been paying attention to the sheriff's office and, and, you know, what goes on there for a long time. But, you know, just in recent weeks with the protests over police brutality, um, you know, the sheriff's office has continued to come under um, a scrutiny. Uh, folks are looking at, you know, what they're doing over there. And so that's something that candidates have addressed, um, you know, how they might um, look at certain reforms or changes that could be made. And so this is definitely a race um, that has some historical components as well, because Oklahoma County has never had a black sheriff and three of the five candidates who filed to run are black men. So um, there's a lot of interesting factors going on in that race. Okay, and one, you also have a, a kind of an interesting narrative going on with the a county commissioner race as well. Tell Absolutely, yeah. So uh, longtime county commissioner Brian Mon is up for re-election. He has been in office since 2008, and um, his last race, he didn't even have an opponent, but he does this time. He has two, um, and, and one is um, Republican Jim Fisher. He was a longtime Oklahoma Highway Patrolman, and so... Commissioner Mon and Jim Fisher are going to go up against each other in the June 30th election. Um, and depending who comes out of that, there is a Democratic challenger, Spencer Hicks. Um, he is the husband of current state Senator Kerry Hicks. And he um, you know, ha is kind of laying low, uh, except though I did see he posted a campaign video uh, today um, kind of spoofing on a, a woman who I believe is, is running for Congress. Um, and she had a very interesting campaign video, so he spoofed that. But otherwise, he's been laying pretty low um, since he's not having to campaign too hard for the June 30th primary. But it'll be interesting to see um, on Jim Fisher's Facebook page. He does have uh, several hundred followers, and folks seem engaged with him. But I've seen a lot of Commissioner Mon's signs around town, um, and you know he's got a lot of longtime supporters in the county as well. So it'll be interesting to see the outcome of that race. Well, and you, and you refer, I thought it was interesting, you referred to the Facebook page, and I know uh, we've, we've talked before about how uh, campaigning has been tough because of, of the COVID pandemic. And, and, and I'd kind of address this to anybody, uh, you know, what do you, what big factors do you see COVID playing in this election cycle and this on, on election day? I mean, what impact is that going to have? Yeah, well, just like you mentioned with uh, campaigning, it's definitely changed the game a little bit. Um, folks are getting creative. They're doing Zoom town halls and just online. They're doing digital um, fundraising campaigns. So a lot of different things um, have been going on there that have made it a little bit more difficult for some. Um, and like Carmen mentioned, um, you know, incumbents may have an edge because they already have those pre-existing ties. Um, but something that was brought up to me was, you know, um, with this election, and really with any election, folks who are older are more likely to vote, but they're the folks who are also less likely to have a social media profile. Um, so there's kind of a gap between connecting with voters and trying to get your message out there and, and, and you know, who's even going to be able to show up to the polls and are they going to know your name? Well, it'll be interesting, though. I mean, there is a, you know, in New York, and I don't know how they conducted their um, elections, you know, how much of it was absentee. But yesterday, another longtime um, New York liberal Democrat got beat. Uh, Congress, you know, uh, Elliot Engel, uh, Democrat, Democratic congressman who'd been there forever. By I think, and um, you know, a progressive, somebody considered more progressive than him. Of course, I mean, in, in Oklahoma, he'd be considered a socialist, you know, or worse. Um, so I, I think what Kayla is saying about incumbents is totally sound logically. But um, you just never know. I mean, in the age of COVID and probably the much lower turnout in New York, some incumbents got beat and um, others, I think, are just barely hanging on. And I think, I think from our perspective, it's COVID has made it hard for us to be able to tell which candidates are getting the most engagement because normally around this time, I, I think all of us would be, you know, going to candidate forums or debates, or we would be shadowing folks that they're knocking on doors or, or whatever. Um, but we haven't been able to do much of that and voters haven't been able to attend a lot of those things. So it, it wonders, it makes me wonder how engaged people are. 
Well, I also wonder, I know a lot of people are going to be voting absentee and by mail, and, and they've had tens of thousands of ballots requested, and it'll be interesting to see how many people return those ballots, how many of those ballots end up being spoiled, because, I mean, I, I did a mail-in ballot, and it wasn't terribly complicated, but it wasn't, you know, dead simple either, so, uh, and how long it's going to take to count all those ballots if they get a huge quantity in, so there's a, there's a lot of unknowns going into this. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's created so much uncertainty. I mean, if it, if COVID had never happened, I, I would bet that, you know, Medicaid expansion would pass close to six, get close to 60. Now you just never know, you know, um, it, it, it's all about who's, who's, who's going to actually go out to vote. And, my, and I, I think it's safe to say a lot of older people aren't going to, um, they're the ones who probably should not. So how many, and they're, and they're your most um, regular voters, you know, older people. So how, how many of them got absentee ballots? I, I, I just don't know. I mean, there's so many, so many questions about this. I assume we'll all be on the ground Tuesday uh, going out to polling places and uh, trying to figure out who all's there. I doubt there are going to be long lines, but you never know because there were. Um, what state was it last week where there were um, – so many long lines. Kentucky, because I think. Yeah, yeah, yesterday, Kentucky had pretty good. It wasn't time. Kentucky, it was last week. And um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just blanking, I'm sorry. Um, so we just don't know what to expect. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, the Oklahoma State Election Board tweeted that they sent out 141,000 um, absentee ballots and that uh, for the 2016 general election, they only sent out 123,000. And in the 2018 general election, it was just 95,000. So definitely a lot more than we've seen in recent years. Sure. And they have said that the lines may be longer at the polling places simply because, you know, because of the social distancing, they can't fit all of the polling booths as close to each other. So they're trying to space them six feet apart. And that might mean there are fewer polling booths at, at one church or at one school, wherever you vote. That's a good point. Okay. Well, listen, yeah, you're, uh, Chris, we are going to be on the ground Tuesday. And uh, if, uh, if you want to know what's going on, go to Oklahoman.com. We will be there uh, until the final vote is counted, uh, however late that takes on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning or whenever that occurs. Uh, we'll also, we also have a lot of good coverage coming up in this, uh, today's paper and tomorrow and the, and the ensuing days until Election Day in the Oklahoman and the newspaper. So online and in print, uh, we're the place to go for election coverage. Uh, listen, I thank you guys for joining us and uh, we'll talk to you soon.